Welcome, everybody, to this webinar on climate change and population dynamics. I am Nico van Imwegen, and I am the Secretary General of the International Union for the Scientific Study of Population, IUSSP. And we are the World Association of Population Experts. If you're not yet a member, please consider to join us. You would be most welcome. And remember, student memberships are free. And if you are a member, even the better. Uh, but then don't forget to vote in our council elections, which opened yesterday. On behalf of the IOSSP Council, I'm very happy to open this webinar, which is a unique collaboration between the IOSSP, one of its oldest, uh, or actually the oldest scientific panel, the Population and Environment Research Network, PERN, more on that later, and also the European Association for Population Studies is joining us in this collaboration. And we look forward to many more of these events. The webinar is uh, the second in a row of uh, the so-called countdown events. And you have seen several of them on the slides. More will come. And these countdown events are, of course, organized to whet our appetite for the upcoming major event, the International Population Conference of the IOSSP, which will convene in, in December. Remember, uh, registration for the IPC started yesterday. So please join us in, at the IPC and more on that uh, conference uh, will, be, uh, will be later. So enough of our self-advertising. We have a very great topic and a, an excellent lineup of speakers. So without further ado, let's get on with the show and over to you, Alex. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Nico. My name is Alex Tshirbanen, and along with Susanna Adamo, I am a co-coordinator of the Population Environment Research Network, or PERN for short, a global network of more than 2,000 scientists and practitioners focusing on population dynamics in the environment. PERN is IUSSP's longest standing scientific panel, and in fact, we are celebrating our 20th year this year. I wish to acknowledge my home institution, season at Columbia University, which is part of the New Climate School at Columbia, which has hosted PERN, as well as the NASA uh, Socioeconomic Data and Application Center, which underwrites PERN's work. PERN is delighted to be a co-organizer for this event, along with the IOSSP and the European Association for Population Studies. This panel includes quite a number of PERN alumni, including Wolfgang Lutz, PERN's founder, and Ryan Mutarek, and Catherine Grace, outgoing and incoming chairs of the PERN Scientific Committee, respectively. I wish to invite you to become a member of PERN. It is free of charge, uh, and uh, we are 2,000 members and growing. I hand over the microphone now to Susanna Adamo, who will give some updates on PERN's uh, or IUSSP's International Population Conference and PERN organized sessions within that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Alex. Uh, thank you all for being here. Good morning, good afternoon. So, uh, as several mentioned, um, the USSP conference is going to happen in December. Um, there is uh, seven sessions on population and environment within the population environment team, and uh, the acceptance and received email for uh, the paper presented was sent on September 14, and the program will be available shortly. So um, again, the registration open uh, on 15 of September. So I hope uh, to see all of you there. Thank you. So I would like to to welcome then uh, all of you and thank thanks. Thanks the panelists, thanks the organizer, and then thanks the, the participants for, for joining us. So Alex, Susanna, and I were thinking that this is probably the right time as we have seen all these extreme climate events as we have seen only summer this year, we have experienced severe flooding in Germany, then in China, and we have the heat wave in um, in the US and in Canada, then forest fires in Southern European country. Currently, Kenya is experiencing extreme drought. So we, we think it's also kind of the right time to, 
sort of start visiting this this question, which is a heart of, 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 of the focus of this seminar. So that's climate change affect population dynamics or not because if if we see that these all of these extreme events already affecting our health our well-being and our livelihood right can be directly or indirectly the floods even in, in germany have killed 200 people so that's a direct impact on mortality but also the drought in kenya it is estimated that it um put 2.1 million people in starvation so it can also add affect health and well-being in that direction. So it's sort of the sensible then to ask the questions if climate change is already affecting us, that it probably sensible that maybe also affect our demographic behaviors and demographic processes, which comprise of fertility, mortality, and migration. Um, and if it does, so if climate change does affect our demographic behaviors, then we might need to revisit the way we do population projections of the future trajectories of population in the future, because at this point, we may need to take into account the impact of climate change on the future population. So far, though, we, we actually don't really know the current um, existing population projection do not actually take into account the impact of climate change on the future population trajectories. So. Um, so this is really the, the, the core interest of this seminar. So we're not really asking about the impact of population on the climate system itself, but another way around. Does climate change affect population dynamics or not? And I am very, very pleased that the I, we have managed to, what I would call assemble the dream team. So the world leading expert on the different topics that our five panelists are gonna speak about. And, um, and uh, we would like to, to sort of go into this, this sequence. So we would start with Wolfgang Lutz from the Wittgenstein Center for Demography and Global Human Capital based in Vienna, which is where I am affiliated as well. So Wolfgang is gonna give an, an overview of the current methodologies and current assumptions that we use for population projection. And then we will move on to the three demographic components. So we would have a speaker that, that sort of try to unpack the impact of climate change on different of the components. So Catherine Grace from University of Minnesota we talk about the climate, the potential impact of climate change on, on fertility. And I have to say that this is the area that we have the least empirical evidence on. Then we move on to, to jo Joanne Bolester from Barcelona Institute of Global Health. And Joanne has a very unique profile because he is both um, climate scientist and also epidemiologist. So He's really an expert on the impact of climate change on health and on mortality. Then Clark Gray, who is the, the one, the person who, who controlled the field of climate change and migration. Clark has done a lot of empirical work that, that show the relationship or evidence on the, uh, between climate change and, and, and migration in almost all areas of the world. So yes, I'm so excited to, to hear from Clark. Then we would close the, the panel discussion with, um, with Landy Sanchez who uh, from the El Colegio de, de Mexico. And Landy is gonna give us some insights about how can we use the existing socioeconomic scenarios, which is called the shared socioeconomic pathways. And how can we use this to inform population, our population projection into the future, but also another way around, how can demography, insight from demography, maybe can inform also the, the, the scenario building and development for the for the climate change community. So I'm gonna stop here and I would already would like to, to invite uh, the first speaker. So the, yeah, so each speaker would speak for 10 minutes. And um, so we, so this would leave us quite, quite a lot of uh, time, roughly 30 minutes for, for discussion. Yes, so please, um, uh, you can always pose your, your question in the Q&A box, so not in the chat box, but the Q&A box, and then some speaker may already start uh, to, to, to reply to your question along the way, and, and then we would have also the uh, question and discussion later on. But without further ado, I would like to invite now Wolfgang to, to, to start, yeah. Good morning. This is uh, Wolfgang Lutz uh, from Vienna, or good afternoon, or depending where you are on this planet. It's really very nice to see on the list of participants so many old friends. So I'm, I'm really very happy that we have this opportunity, at least for an electronic encounter. So as I said, I should give a 
a somewhat uh, larger overview of uh, the how we look into the future in the field of population. Um, it's also said it's 20 years of PERN now, and I'm very happy to see uh, PERN uh, going well, going strong uh, after that long time. And uh, actually, since it was said, I was involved in helping to set it up uh, 20 years ago in 2001. And it was also in 2001 uh, that we produced a book on population and climate change. So we'll start with a piece of history uh, together with Brian O'Neill, a climate scientist who, with a keen interest in population, and Landis McKellar, uh, who you may know as uh, editor of Population and Development Review, and uh, also for some time he was running the IOSSP office in, in Paris. So uh, the three of us to jointly tried to summarize what was the state of uh, knowledge on climate change as well as on population futures for the 21st century. And when I looked at this book again, it's really included all of the, the basic uh, facts uh, already of climate change and the forecasts have not changed that much. It was at that time, just the third IPCC report, the third assessment report has come out. You know that right now the sixth is uh, coming out. There have been some progress, significant progress in the climate science, but the main message is there. And the same uh, with respect to population. I've just looked at the forecasts. It's sort of more or less uh, 10 billion people that will reach uh, over the course of the uh, 21st century. And uh, that's not so different what uh, the forecasts uh, of today show us. So where has been the change? The change that this book didn't really get much attention at the time, uh, in, only in some very narrow scientific circles. So what has really changed is not the science itself, it's not the forecast, but it's the public awareness that has changed so dramatically that now climate change is a topic everywhere. Uh, within demography, there has also been uh, one change that uh, particularly we around Yasa and the Wittgenstein Center have been involved in. It is also reflected in these SSP scenarios that you will soon see uh, that there has been work on introducing this multidimensional demographic concept of not only studying the population by age and sex, but add additional attributes, uh, in particular educational attainment. You see this uh, age pyramid where color is added, giving the education structure uh, in the case of Korea, South Korea. And you see red means no education. And you see in 1970, still a half of the adult population of South Korea above age 30 had never been to school because this education expansion was so recent after World War II. And then we can follow these same cohorts uh, as they move up the age pyramid. And we see uh, that at the bottom, more and more people get education. Korea had one of the most rapid education expansions. And since education has so many consequences, it empowers people uh, to have better health it as a matters for reproductive behavior and fertility. It matters for economic growth. And as we'll see, it also matters for adaptive capacity to climate change. So this modeling of human capital formation through cohort replacement that Norman Ryder also called the demographic metabolism uh, is really something uh, that has been added uh, to the discussion. Here you just see the most recent SSP scenarios if they have been updated in 2018 together with the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. You see the middle SSP2, the middle of the road scenario. Uh, dark blue means post-secondary education, light blue secondary. You see well, population still increasing until likely uh, to, to peak under this scenario. In the second half, uh, uh, proportion of uneducated people diminishing under this scenario and the SSP1, the rapid progress scenario, there's even much faster education uh, expansion, but the SSP3, which in demographic terms is the stalled development scenario, will have less improvement uh, and uh, the world population may increase to up to the more than uh, 12 billion. So uh, how do we view uh, generally conceptualize human population change in its interaction with climate change? And of course, the topic that has been studied most frequently in the largest number of studies is the impact of human population on uh, climate change, on the greenhouse gases. And to reduce this, that's what we call the mitigation of climate change. Now this goes through um, consumption behavior, energy consumption, but we humans are also the ones who uh, sort of advance technologies like greener technologies that can help 
reduce the CO2 emissions per uh, unit of consumption spent. Uh, we don't go today into the question of how population growth drives climate change. I just want to add this uh, new insight, I would say, uh, that uh, we need to come to zero emissions over the next uh, 20, essentially to 30 years. And with this in mind, uh, the population growth that's going to happen in the second half of the century is less relevant than our behavioral change, our technological change right now in the near future. Now, in this seminar, we really look on the fact how climate uh, change uh, through its different aspects of temperature, humidity, extreme events, sea level rise, and so on, affects uh, human health and mortality directly, affects the livelihood, and therefore indirectly also migration. And even we're going to have a presentation on how it affects fertility. And in this whole field, uh, what is important is that not every member of the population is equally affected, but we have what you see in red here, demographic differential vulnerability. In other words, people of different age groups, uh, uh, men and women and different education groups are likely to be uh, vulnerable to a different extent. Now we have uh, operationalized this. I just want to uh, show you the outcome of one simulation exercise that we published in science uh, some years ago, uh, where we have on the right hand side uh, a prediction of some scenarios about uh, death in millions uh, as, as they are forecast. And here it is important uh, to say that climate change and many studies, even uh, WHO studies assessing, let's say, the future number of malaria death in Eastern Africa, they do a, a current mistake. They take the climate as it is projected for the future, let's say for 2070, and match it with today's population, with today's public health capabilities, with today's societies. So the, the most important message I want to give you there, the climate of the future will affect the population of the future and not the population of today. So we need to make significant efforts to also anticipate what are the vulnerabilities, what is the public health capability, um, uh, societal uh, possibilities of dealing with climate change. And we believe that these uh, age, sex, and education-specific forecasts are a good means for doing so. So you see here the blue lines, they are the SSP3, that is sort of the stalled development, high population size, little education, under three different climate change scenarios, and they will have a very significant increase in death immediately caused by natural disasters that are accounted for by climate change. On the other hand, with the rapid development, the SSP1, uh, you uh, see that even under rather strong climate change, you have uh, possibly even a decline in the number of fatalities. Because we assume that the consequence of the much better uh, education, also the public health capabilities of the poorest countries will be much better than today. There will be many fewer of subsistence farmers who are the most vulnerable. And so on society will continue to develop and not only the climate is changing. Now, let me just come uh, in conclusion to sort of a bit overview of what uh, population projections are based on. Uh, I, some time ago, we had a special issue of the International Statistical Review on how to deal with uncertainty in population forecasting, edited together with Josh Goldstone of Berkeley. And there we have sort of six different levels that on the one hand, we uh, go sort of blind statistical extrapolation. That's the one extreme. And unfortunately, there are some examples of this where you essentially people put a ruler on the past trend and say, that's the future. And then on the other extreme at the bottom, you have sort of pure expert opinions without justification. That's what usually is done in a Delphi study. You just ask people what they believe will happen without having to justify this. And then you closer, you go from both sides to the middle, the more sophisticated it gets. Sort of the number two, there is sort of some sophisticated statistical extrapolation models. And that's what the UN is most recently using and also this uh, projections that you may have seen for the, by the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation published two years ago. Uh, then from the other you bottom, you go expert opinions, not just at face value, but the experts have to argue uh, what are the arguments on which the assumptions are based. And then there are all kinds of ways of blending statistical extrapolation uh, with uh, expert knowledge. That's sort of what our uh, most recent uh, YASA projections have been done. Just a footnote, 
that the United Nations population projections up to 2010, when they had an important structural change, were more on the side, they were sort of purely expert-based assumptions, and then they radically moved their model to a sophisticated, very complex uh, Bayesian statistical extrapolation model. Now, uh, what does, how does this affect the world? We want to know sort of what uh, policies make a difference for population uh, futures. And in this context, of course, the uh, ra paradigm that everybody talks about in the world is this sustainable development goals. And uh, here we've published some time ago, a paper where we try to simulate what are the impacts of actually meeting uh, the SDGs. And here it's in particularly uh, the SDG uh, three on health, including reproductive health and child mortality, maternal mortality, as well as the SDG four on universal uh, female and male primary and secondary education. That was the important thing that unlike the millennium development goals, the sustainable development goals also ask for universal secondary education. And here you see the different population scenarios. You see the, uh, the green and gray area, that's the range of the UN population projections, the uncertainty range that they give. And then you see the green, that is the middle of the road SSP scenario, um, as uh, I've just been talking about. But then there is the SSP one, that's the red wine, where you have a really very rapid development throughout the century. And then the blue area there, the blue range, is uh, sort of just having a turbo boost in development, but only with a time horizon 2015 to 2030. That is sort of- Wolfgang, what can you wrap in one minute, please? Okay, <laughs> yes. So this is just showing how uh, different assumptions uh, impact uh, on uh, the world population outlook. And I stop here with uh, a two short um, announcement. There's this global sustainable development report that really try, uh, that has been uh, issued by the UN Secretary General to say where we stand. And I happen to be one of the 15 international experts. So if you want to catch up on where we, the world stands on sustainable development, I think that is worthwhile. And finally, in conclusion, just this week, uh, an advanced introduction to demography a book has come out that uh, really deals with many of these issues of multidimensional population dynamics in more detail. But I'll stop here. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much, Wolfgang. So Wolfgang's already raised actually many important questions that addressing the complexity of, of how we do population projection, already different method with you, different population size and composition. And, and there are many different forces. We Here we focus on how climate change may affect population dynamics, which of course, the different policy uh, sustainable development goals, or even the COVID may also affect. So that's something we have to think about also. But now we have Kat, who's going to share with us her, Kat is really the, the, the first person who deal with the climate change and fertility. I'm really excited to hear what uh, your insight, Kat. Thanks so much. Uh, well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And thank you for organizing this and inviting me um, and including me. And of course, thanks to all the people whose work on PERN um, over the years has actually been so important for me as a scholar, as a baby new scholar learning all this. So I'm thrilled to be here. Um, so my background, actually, I'm a geographer, mostly a statistician, spent a lot of time with clients, cl um, climate scientists, and then also had a whole sort of public health component. Um, so this is kind of the perfect area for me. Also, I'm really passionate about women's health. So this is really a, a great space for me. Um, okay, so I was, I'm going to structure my talk um, around this question um, that we were asked by the organizers. Um, in particular, does or will climate change affect fertility and reproductive health? And what do I think is next in terms of population projections? So I'll just go ahead and say, my answer for population projections is not going to be super satisfying, but I'm very excited to hear Landy talk about it because Landy is truly an expert in thinking about the complexities of this. So we'll hear from her too, so that'll be great. Whoops, um, there we go. Okay, so first I wanted to define this. Um, this is an ongoing issue, actually, when we talk about climate change and health, um, we're not always clear what we're talking about with climate change. Um, and the scale and scope that we talk about it as demographers is often quite a bit different than how climate science talks, climate scientists talk about it. So it is worth commenting on. 
Okay, so climate change is associated with long-term average changes in temperature and precipitation conditions. It's unclear how perceptible these are to individuals. We're thinking about, you know, the two um, degrees increase in warming, that kind of thing. But we also see extreme events uh, like Raya mentioned in the beginning. And then where my area of focus is primarily um, is on this question of shifts in seasonal conditions like shorter or delayed rainy seasons or greater, greater variability in rainfall conditions during the rainy season. Um, so the way that these relate to demographic outcomes is actually going to be quite different and quite important to think about the how they impact people's lives and how they make decisions around in response to these or in preparation for these events. So in terms of fertility, the population equation, of course, focuses on live births. Um, but the question of fertility becomes much bigger in term and in, in it's often engages questions of reproductive health and family planning, including a lot of work on concepts of unmet contraceptive need. Um, as we've gotten sort of, um, <clears throat> as our data has changed a bit and we've started to expand the way that we think about live birth events and the process of a live birth event, there's a lot more work going on on pregnancy and conceptions and non-live birth outcomes, including both induced and spontaneous abortion. And then of course, Raya also mentioned um, food insecurity or malnutrition, and that shows up a lot, um, infant health, lactation, feeding and care, as well as questions related to birth spacing. So really within this fertility question, we have quite a bit of different topics that are related to this sort of you know, it, it original focus on live birth events. So here's the spoiler. You could stop listening to the rest of my talk after this because I'll tell you everything, or at least I'll tell you my opinion. So yes, climate change will affect and already has affected fertility and reproductive health. I'm not sure how we're going to be able to observe these effects at the aggregate, um, especially at the country level. I work at the, the micro level, mostly at the individual scale. So thinking about how to aggregate the information that we have at that scale up to a country level is I think an area of active inquiry. And some of what Wolfgang just presented highlighted some ways of thinking about different dimensions of population, but I think we still have quite a bit, especially when you, know, you think about all these different ways that climate change can show up in people's lives. Um, but we should definitely still consider climate change, fertility, and population. Um, but I do think it's a good time to start having some different types of conversations about it. Um, there's some good go conversations going on in the feminist literature about different ways of thinking about this question that doesn't place the burden on um, especially poor women to change their behaviors. So let me go ahead and explain my thinking. Um, so this is a framework that integrates climate change and reproductive health or fertility and reproductive health. And what you'll see is that this is sort of organized in terms of mul multiple scales. So we have the individual scale, the household scale and the contextual scale, the local scale. And so local can take on different definitions depending upon what your interest is. Um, but the idea here, or sort of there's a lot going on and all, all, as there always is in frameworks, but what we have is a solid line from climate to individual level maternity, uh, maternal and reproductive health outcomes. So that could be something like heat stress, which has a much more direct link than something like food insecurity, for example. Um, so this dashed line here is talking about all these different pathways um, that climate change could show up in a person's life. And this is what, what Wolfgang was highlighting too, is that there's going to be differences in who's at risk. Um, and, and how vulnerability plays out. And so we can start to think about that and understand that a little bit better using these different kinds of pathways. So from the kind of micro level research that we've seen, we see a lot of different um, analyses, especially focusing on temperatures um, and rainfall. We see some other things that go on too in terms of vegetation or food insecurity or other environmental factors. But in general, hot temperatures are bad for health. We see an increase in infant mortality, an increase in stillbirth and miscarriage, an increase in failed or missed conceptions, um, and shifts in breastfeeding behavior. Some of these have a direct link to this population count, the live births, and some of, this some of these have a more indirect link. Um, low rainfall is generally bad for health in terms of its impact on food insecurity, disease, um, and its potential to reduce household resources. And again, this is a situation where we have both more direct 
links and indirect links. So a reduction of household resources might really happen at a very fine scale. So thinking about this in terms of households within communities and even five kilometers apart, you might have very, in, in say rural West Africa, you might have very different um, seasonal conditions and very different outcomes in terms of household resources that are related to seasonal productivity. So one of the things that we're working on a lot in this area of research is trying to think about how to better capture these pathways in our quantitative analyses so that we can identify sort of how risk happens or how it manifests in people's lives, especially in terms of this question of reproductive health and fertility decision making. Um, and so this is a recent paper that we looked at sort of these different primary pathways that we see for in terms of fertility and reproductive health, food insecurity, disease, and heat stress. It's a big quantitative question and a big data question because there's so much data we're trying to integrate in a way that makes sense with women's lives. Now, for macro level research, um, and this is from uh, a recent article um, by Brian O'Neill and colleagues. And so this, just like, I, I actually don't even need to spend too much time on this because Wolfgang did such a good job presenting it. But both this kind of presentation of educational transition or fertility, fertility change and education transition happening together, um, or sort of those population pyramids that Wolfgang and Raya worked on, can we incorporate these different degrees or dimensions of climate vulnerability, you know, in terms of seasonal change and, and that sort of thing? We have this whole other question of cohort and tempo, uh, I mean, of, uh, of quantum and tempo happening in terms of fertility. So are we just going to see shifts? that people catch up for, or is this going to be something that we see lifelong changes in people's um, fertility behaviors? Those are There's a lot of questions about that that we don't have great answers to that make shifting to a macro level a little bit complicated to do. Um, so there is a, quite a bit of work in the targeting of resources in terms of uh, malnutrition that is working to integrate micro level and macro level, because I think that that's, again, one of the big questions here is how do we bring those pieces together so that we can think about the micro level heterogeneity and how that relates to uh, how we aggregate that in a way that makes sense and captures the the complexities on the ground. Um, so for me, um, this is Kenya, for me, this kind of map is macro. Um, I know for many of you, it is not macro. So maybe we can say it's some sort of middle level, but the goal here was to kind of use these micro level models to help inform um, areas of concern or vulnerability to help identify those, the, the modeling that we use to identify those, because this makes more sense, the scale might make more sense for an intervention. Um, so perhaps we can explore that dimension or that idea when we think about fertility and climate change too. Another thing that I think is really important to address um, is kind of the history of uh, reproductive justice um, and what, what women are dealing with um, in terms of access to, to family planning and that sort of thing. And also this idea of inequality and climate change exposures as well as fertility related responses. So what we're increasingly paying attention to is the intersectionality of these kinds of things and how a lot of this is playing out at a place level, so a community level. Um, so how does inequality and access to resources or an exposure show up in the way that we see these different fertility outcomes. Um, and so there's both a uh, sort of quantitative question about how do we consider spatial correlation? How do we bring that into our modeling? But then also this bigger question of what is this process of inequality and difficulty accessing resources? There's bigger questions too about data justice and data sovereignty. Who gets to decide what questions are asked or included or valued? Um, and how do we make sure that we have the people who are being most affected by some of these policies included in the data discussion? And I think Wolfgang highlighted some of that, the complexity in how we understand these things as well. Um, but this idea of nothing about us without us to make sure that that's showing up in how we talk about climate change and fertility as well. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much, Kat. Uh, I, I thought I, I asked a simple question that's kind of gender fertility, but it's uh, extremely complex from the mechanisms, the heterogeneity. And I think one thing that uh, you, you're showing, it's sort of, it probably kind of the mechanisms that, that may apply a bit more maybe to rural communities, maybe to, to, to lower income country. Then we have another 
changes in sort of how people think about fertility intention in, in higher income country, right? So sort of, well, neither want children anymore because of climate change. I think it's also interesting to do. Maybe we can discuss on this later. And then another thing that you, that you raise is, is the aggregation. And I think, yeah, because that would affect how we're going to do population projection. I think another aggregation in, in terms of te temporal, right? So I'm thinking about, because uh, about jo Joanne is gonna give us a talk soon. Um, when we think about climate change may reduce excess winter mortality, but may increase excess, um, what is it, <laughs> summer mortality. So in total, maybe it just crossed out. So I'm curious to see how do we deal with mortality in uh, our population projection as well. So Joanne, the floor is here, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Raya. Um, let me share the screen. So first of all, thank you so much to the organizers for the invitation and especially taking into account that perhaps my um, background is uh, quite different from the others. Um, I'm, I work in the climate and health program of IS Global. I am by training a climate scientist that has been moving towards epidemiology and now to social sciences. And so we have, uh, we see things with the perspective of the climate system and the earth system. And so um, perhaps I'm gonna give a different perspective of, of these climate change projections. First of all, just to mention that uh, in our group, we use different tools and different methods and different models, depending on the uh, process that we want to study from earth system models, for example, for climate dynamics and for the study of the teleconnections of the system and the associated predictability to uh, down to urban climate models in which we look at more local processes associated, for example, with the urban heat island effect, um, and also processes like air pollution or the inequalities within a metropolitan area. And in between, we have also the regional climate models that are really useful to explore the um, climate predictability and to design either climate change projections or uh, early warning systems. And so here in, uh, Regarding the question that uh, Raya was uh, formulating, in my case, uh, I would like to uh, to change it slightly and to talk about how population changes uh, can affect climate impact projections. And here I'm going to focus on the most direct uh, impact of uh, on human health, which is heat and cold related mortality. It can be applied also to, for example, air pollution or mineral dust. And, and so to begin with, this is an example, a recent example that we have published uh, a couple of months ago. Here I put the pictures just for recognition of the people that were leading the investigation. And so uh, we use the exposure, the projection of the exposure for different climate change scenarios. And we use these epidemiological techniques well established in the literature. And we calculate the evolution of these temperature attributable mortality in this case for, for temperature. And the results show that uh, there is this, uh, there is a transition period between a period of decreasing trend in mortality and a period, depending on this scenario of increasing mortality, defining this optimum counterfactual climate that is very close to the present according to the projections and an, an important aspect is the huge heterogeneity in these projections. So if we, for example, even within uh, Europe, which is quite homogeneous uh, in terms of socioeconomics, uh, we see very large differences. Some of them coming from the climate change projections so from the climate component and some others from the vulnerability to the climate conditions. And in this case, we see much higher vulnerability uh, to temperatures in the Mediterranean, so in the south of the map, compared to Central or Northern Europe. That's um, both driven by the climate component and the vulnerability. Another aspect, for example, that we can highlight from these projections is are the nonlinearities and the tipping points. This is a follow-up uh, research piece from, from Marcos Quijal Zamorano. And in this case, we were using the same projections in order to analyze uh, 
the impact of the uh, temperatures that have not been experienced so far. So those that are that have not occurred in the past and that will represent in the future record breaking temperatures. And we see that uh, we have, depending on the projections, depending on the emissions, um, we uh, find very different impact uh, of this uh, unobserved uh, extreme heat. This is represented for the July uh, mortality in the uh, dark red uh, shading. And this is important because we have no idea about the degree to which we are able to adapt to these uh, temperatures. We can have through epidemiological models, we can have an idea of how we have adapted in the past. Um, and so we can make guesses of how we will uh, adapt in the future, but we cannot infer anything from the very extreme temperatures. Because, for example, we don't know if uh, we will exceed any uh, physiological limit. And so these are examples of how important is adaptation, because most of these projections are based on uh, constant vulnerability. We we're talking before about uh, the importance of uh, population, future population. Um, but also another important aspect is the, uh, is the vulnerability. If we take into account uh, realistic scenarios of adaptation, so realistic scenarios of uh, changes in vulnerability. Uh, the evidence so far for historical for the past, it shows that, uh, that there has been a progressive adaptation process in many regions. Here is the example uh, from a couple of studies for uh, cardiovascular and respiratory mortality in Spain. And this figure shows several aspects that needs, need to be taken into account, and not only the change in vulnerability, but also the uh, different rate of adaptation of different um, population groups. Here it shows men and women, but also it, there are many other factors, education, age, etc., that uh, also show very different adaptation response in the past. And also here's something that was not, uh, that is um, a more recent result is the difference also depending on the causes of death. So that's another important aspect that if we want to make realistic projections of climate change, um, of the climate change impacts, we also have to take into account in the area of human health, the, um, the causes of these diseases and, and mortality. Another aspect also are the social factors at local scales. It, the, the different populations, even within a city, have very different vulnerability. This is the C, a map for the city of Barcelona. And so um, this, when we do projections at local scales, we need to take into account the underlying socioeconomic and demographic factors that explain these different vulnerability within, uh, within a city, within a metropolitan area. And on top of that, we have other factors that need to be taken into account. Uh, this is from a previous paper uh, with uh, Jean-Marie Robin, uh, François Richard Hermann, and Xavier Rudeau, in which we showed the, that, the, uh, that the mortality, the changes through time in, mortal, in mortality are also associated with changes in time in, for example, in the business cycle. So if we want to do more realistic uh, projections uh, of the health outcomes, and a, a way to do it is to take uh, to use any projection of the um, macroeconomic indicators, for example, and even by including typical cycles, so the year-to-year -year variability, and project it into a future in order to provide some year-to-year -year variability in the projections that it does not only come from the um, from the climate system, so from the exposure. And so all these factors that are more or less not taken into account in current projections are the motivation of a new project that has started this year in IS Global. It's called Early Adapt. It will last for five years and in which we want to address these uh, issues. Uh, it is based on the hypothesis that the early adaptation response to climate change is heterogeneous. And so we want to investigate the uh, drivers of this heterogeneous response to the warming.
And so it will consider different health outcomes, different environmental variables. And importantly for this, for this webinar, it will analyze the, driving, uh, the drivers of these uh, differences, this heterogeneity of, in the early adaptation response to uh, climate change by taking into account multiple uh, socioeconomic and demographic factors in order to investigate several key uh, processes that uh, are still not known about the uh, early adaptation response in the past in order to make uh, more realistic projections into the future. And this is going to be done through the analysis of different layers of data sets uh, from the continental level to countries, regions, and cities. And each uh, data set will be used in order to analyze a subset of these drivers, for example, air pollution at the local level, and um, for example, macroeconomic indicators at the continental one. And so that, that was the presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Joan. Um, one of the many different <laughs> important questions that you raised, it's also actually applied to, to migration when you talk about adaptation and then the way we work on historical data, we kind of, I don't want to spoil <laughs> Clark, uh, of course, talk because Clark is, is an expert, but sort of, yeah, we tend to use historical data and we look at the, how climate events affect migration, but we don't know yeah. the world of two degree and three degree how migration would look like. But maybe Clark has some insights for us on this issue as well. So Clark, the floor is yours. Thank you. All right, let me just get set up here. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. Okay, great. I'm Clark Gray from uh, the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And uh, I'm gonna be talking about uh, how climate change affects migration, um, uh, which is uh, just been my main area of work for, uh, for quite a while now. I made a little outline, but I uh, really just have two points that, um, that I wanna make. So, um, I'll be able to do that pretty easily in 10 minutes, I think. Uh, the first is that um, public understanding, understanding of this process, uh, climate change and migration, um, so far as they're represented in uh, policy documents and uh, news media, um, are pretty disconnected uh, from, um, from what we know about this process uh, from, from the scholarly literature. So I feel like there's... And I'll and I'll summarize what what I think we know, but I think there's really a task for for all of us as as population environment researchers to try and communicate this uh, more clearly. Um, and the second main point I want to make is that um, buttressing our our ability to 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 combat those simplistic narratives about climate refugees, for example, is we do have new global evidence that is. Uh, either coming out or um, is, is now can be generated with, uh, with new data sources. So I'm gonna talk about a couple of uh, global scale meta-analyses, one of which Rye was involved in, and also a couple of projects, if I have time, a couple of projects that I'm involved in that involve uh, global synthesis of uh, uh, climate effects on migration and, and related outcomes, which is something that's been hard to do uh, up to now. Um, so I just pulled a few headlines from the New York Times to show that, as you're probably aware, these, uh, these issues are very much in public discussion, uh, perhaps uh, more so than uh, climate change and fertility, for example. Um, but again, the, the framing of, of, of climate change and migration in, in these articles, and I don't mean to pick on the New York Times because it's a general phenomenon, um, is uh, as climate climate refugees as a distinct process, a distinct set of people, a new process uh, where impoverished people will be driven long distances. And, um, and, and that, that framing, that view is just not consistent with, with what we know about climate change and migration. Um, and there is now quite a large literature on climate change and migration. When I got into this field, there was very little. There was Sabine Henry, <laughs> and that was about it. 
um maybe she's listening uh but uh so there's there's a lot of studies out there and helpfully to summarize those studies there's uh there's been a few recent um reviews the first one of these here is a a, a systematic review and then uh two quantitative meta-analyses um so that uh, analyzing previous regression results and the second one of these is still under review so anyway if you're if you're interested in getting into this literature more these three articles are a good a good place to start um and so let me just summarize what we know what i think we know <laughs> from my own work and from the reading of those uh of these reviews uh the first thing is that there is a climate to migration signal uh Climate change is already affecting human migration. So, um, but it does not happen. It is not something that looks like conflict, un, that looks like displacement under armed conflict, for example. What it looks like is the forms of migration that we already mostly observe. And so, um, where are climate change effects on migration most common? They're most common and strongest in middle income countries not the poorest countries and unsurprisingly not the richest countries and this is consistent with everything we know about migration which is that to make moves particularly long distance moves you have to have resources and um and that's true also for climate for climate induced migration um and so it's not the most impoverished people who are making climate induced moves in fact many of them might be trapped which i'll talk about in a second Unsurprisingly, countries that are directly dependent on climate in the form of being agricultural are also seem to be more affected by uh, more more affected by uh, climate in terms of movement. Um, another thing that gets a lot of attention in uh, in in uh, public attention, which is not really the core issue, are short term events like um, floods, earthquakes, tsunamis. Um, those short-term events definitely displace people, but most of those people come back. Uh, the events that tend to cause long-term and larger scale displacement are what are called slow onset changes. So, um, you know, changes over one, five, 10 years to local climates in terms of drying and warming in particular. Um, and of course, under climate change, long-term warming is what we expect to see. So, I mean, just, so that means, you know, I'm not a population projections person, but, you know, I think one takeaway from this is that we, you know, in most parts of the world, we will see more migration under climate change uh, is one takeaway from this literature. Drought will also be more common in, in, in some parts of the world, but people also often make the assumption that drought will, will be more common everywhere. And that, that's not actually what the, my reading of the climate science says. Um, Another assumption that's often made is that uh, climate displacement will uh, will become visible as international moves, whereas what we see is that although there is an effect on international moves, international migration is quite rare and expensive uh, for most uh, potential migrants, and and so it's really going to be internal moves that are most responsive um, to uh, to climate change. And there are other types of moves like temporary and circulate circulatory moves that we don't we haven't actually, we don't have that much evidence on yet. The other point I want to make is that uh, something that clearly comes across in these reviews in my own work is that not only can climate, adverse climate exposures displace people, but they can also trap people. Um, and again, this is consistent with everything we know about migration, which is that it's costly and often positively selected. Uh, if your livelihood is being undermined by, uh, you know, novel temperature and precipitation conditions, you might not be able to send a son or daughter to a city, or you might not be able to make an international move. And that is that is exactly what we observe. And the, many of these studies that are summarized in these reviews observe in, particularly in low income contexts. And for me, this is really the, the humanitarian issue that we should focus on. If people are moving in response to climate change, then they're very likely to be better off. If they're trapped, then things, things can really only get worse from that. Uh, so I feel like when we talk to people in the press and the policy spheres, we need to emphasize that uh, trapping is probably as, as much of a concern as, as, as displacement. And of course, a lot of the concern about displacement is driven by anti-migrant bias in the public. And so, you know, that is, that is part of what we need to push back against. Um, 
So uh, I'm not timing myself, so I may run out of time, but I'm going to talk briefly about a couple of studies that I'm involved in that um, try and produce additional evidence at the global scale. One is using the IPOMS Terra data interface through the University of Minnesota. If you haven't checked out the IPOMS data interfaces, they're amazing. And you can access uh, census, DHS data, a lot of other things. So I've been using these in a lot of my work. The Terra interface integrates uh, survey data and census data um, with, uh, with environmental data, including, including climate data. And you can download everything in a single data file, which is amazing. Um, and so what we've done in this project, this is with Maya Call, who's at USAID, we, um, we've accessed information about subnational population growth rates from all of these units you can see here at the bottom of the slide. For all of these subnational units, so they're districts or provinces, essentially, uh, we've accessed uh, population growth rates over at least two census periods, intercensal periods, and then we've, co we've compared that to um, decadal uh, climate exposures. Um, and we, we generate this nice graphic because we have an interactive uh, regression specification. Uh, it's a fixed effects uh, regression uh, with, uh, with interaction between climate and, and uh, between temperature and precipitation. And, uh, and uh, so I'll just summarize the story for you. The story for you is that when things are cool, cooler than relative, these are, we've specified climate as We've measured climate as anomalies, which are essentially z-scores of the climate. When things are relatively cool, there's, there's some variation in population growth with climate, but not that much. When things are hot, which is, of course, the direction we're headed, we see, we see quite a bit of variation in pop, uh, subnational population growth with, um, with precipitation. Uh, dry and hot conditions lead to close to zero population growth on average, but not depopulation. There's another narrative that vulnerable places in the developing world are going to be completely depopulated by climate change. And we definitely don't see that here. We see enough people leaving and, uh, you know, there may be a mortality and fertility component to that, to this too. We can't, we can't exactly sort it out, but this is probably mostly about net migration. Uh, there's enough people leaving that population growth becomes close to zero in these places that have had relatively high population growth overall, whereas when things are wet, uh, more people appear to be moving in and population growth is faster. And so the takeaway from this project so far is that uh, climate warming makes places more vulnerable to, uh, to precipitation induced uh, population change essentially, but it's not a linear story from temperature, local temperature change to uh, to uh, population going up and down. Um, I'm getting the uh, I'm getting the thumbs down from Raya, so I'll just say quickly that uh, we have a new uh, project going on. This is with Brian Feedy at Penn State. We're going to use the entire set of um, geo reference THS surveys, demographic and health surveys to look at um, the relationship between climate exposures and the health of children, uh, expanding on some other previous work we did. And then we're also gonna look at adults. We're gonna look at uh, the temporary migration, um, uh, BMI, and, uh, and also fertility of, of adults. So we'll try and capture a few of the axes uh, of, uh, of here, and we've we've only just gotten started with this with the subsample in sub-Saharan Africa, but we do see that um, extreme temperatures in these two graphics do both displace. This is for women, do displace them temporarily, and also undermine their their BMI. Uh, so more on that coming for next year's meetings, hopefully. Um, so I'll just wrap up quickly to say that um, climate change is affecting human migration already. But this is mostly going to occur as a part of existing migration flows. There's, there's, there's no evidence to think that there's going to be a distinct population of climate refugees who, um, who we can easily sort out from all the other migrants. Uh, and personally, I think we need to be more concerned about trapping than displacement. There's a huge literature in demography that shows that migrants tend to do quite well. And migration tends to benefit both origins and destinations. And, and there's no evidence to think that climate-induced migrations would be qualitatively different. So I'm more concerned about trapping than displacement. Um, I'll stop there. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much, Clark. I
I'm happy to see that we started uh, already gets a bit more consistent evidence because I think, as you said, when when Sabine Henry started and the other literature that 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 came after sort of always makes evident, but now we we tend to have this sort of consistent story. And then your your last project on on the geo reference here is so so exciting. That means I don't have to do some of the work in my own project or the three. I could just grab your results and plug it in the projection. So thank, thanks for that. And uh, so Landy, now we move towards the future, and you would explain to us also the SSP, the famous chess associated pathway scenario. Thanks, Lenny. Thank you, Ryan. Um, well, thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be in this panel um, and sharing the panel, particularly with people whose work I follow closely and, and I read with a lot of attention. So. Um, I'm going to talk precisely about what are the shared socioeconomic pathways that several of you already mentioned, um, how is population considered in, the, in this SSSP and what is not, uh, how could demographers contribute to the SSSP even further. Um, so um, let me just start by saying, um, imagine that you want to study the impact of climate change in land productivity and food prices because you want to study how climate change will impact household poverty and demographic behavior. As you already heard for other, from others, uh, what, you, uh, what you need is climate and social data, right? Um, but we all know that to understand household poverty and demographic behavior, we, um, we know that that's not only depend, as, as we heard already from the last presentations, uh, we don't only need to understand what are the impacts in terms of, for example, uh, temperature or precipitation in, in the past, but we also want to understand how that is going to change into the future. Um, and for that, we already know that household poverty, for example, will depend on temperature and the agricultural uh, yields. But we also need, for example, information about um, the share of, of rural population. And we also need to understand um, the labor force participation of women, and for example, things about social policies. Um, and so how that is going to play out into the future, that's exactly what uh, shared socioeconomic uh, pathways try to answer. So what we are trying to get is precisely information. The shared socioeconomic pathways try to describe possible worlds into the future, right? So what they are trying to present is a way to understand how societies are going to evolve. Um, so and the. Uh, the SSSP are a scenarios, they are a tool to understand how societies are going to change. And for that, they have two components. On the one hand, they have a narrative, a storylines, uh, how the world will change on a particular pathway. And on the other hand, they have quantitative measure of those changes, particularly on a uh, set of drivers. Um, they talk about economy, technology, governance, institutions, and of course, population. So the graph on the right hand, uh, you can see five of those uh, SSP that are the most common one used. Um, and you can see a couple of things that are very relevant in order to understand the shared socioeconomic pathways. Uh, the first thing is that the SSP are scenarios that think together challenge to mitigation and challenge to adaptation. So for example, the SSSP-5 is a war in which we might, it is a war that represents a, a, a growth that is very fast, a, a war that is very rich, but is fuel but fossils. And therefore, it represents a lot of challenge for mitigation, right? We have a lot of emissions into the atmosphere. On the other hand, it has relatively low challenge for adaptation because it's a rich world who has, who has, a, lot of, has a lot of investment in capital, health, and it has a relative high growth, economic growth, which allows adaptation. But if you look on the other extreme, the SSSP4, it will represent a world in which we have high inequalities within countries and between countries. 
And therefore, it will imply a world has a lot of challenge for adaptation, but not so much for mitigation because precisely it doesn't have a lot of growth. And therefore, emissions will uh, be relatively low in that double world. So you can see already that this type of uh, scenarios allow you to think how development, the type of path that we will follow in the coming years will matter for achieving certain mitigation goals and also for the way that we will adapt to the, the um, climate change uh, impacts, right? And of course, it has some assumptions about how those worlds uh, are gonna become uh, in, the, in, the next, uh, in the coming decades. So particularly for population, uh, the, the population dynamics that are behind this type of scenarios are two main areas, population growth and urbanization. And uh, Lufon already uh, talked about that, uh, the population uh, growth and the population projections that are behind these scenarios uh, have assumption of fertility, mortality, migration, and also the educational composition of the population. While uh, urbanization talks about the rate of urbanization and the spatial pattern that will follow. I'm not going to go into the details of each of the SSP that are around, but I'm just going to show you very rapidly this uh, table uh, on the right side uh, so that you can get a sense of how these uh, assumptions are uh, built into this SSP. And you can see already that uh, we have these assumptions that vary by different uh, kind of degrees of uh, income and fertility levels across the world. And therefore, we can already uh, see that um, there will be variation across, uh, across uh, not only as SSP, but also across the countries in, in the world. So very easily, you can imagine that from these type of scenarios, we, can, we will end up with very different type of population size and very different shares of organization. And that will also uh, have different implications across uh, the globe. You are working on climate change. So this is a very interesting development since 2015, more or less, when the SSP become uh, um, a tool that has, uh, has been developed from then uh, up to today. Um, and the gains that we have is basically because we integrate better uh, issues about mitigation and adaptation. We, have, we can address better issues concerning climate policies and also because we can imagine now that um, the demographic and socioeconomic development pathways can different type of work can lead to the same type of uh, level of emissions in the world, right? Uh, also, it has been very exciting times because uh, um, uh, there are the different groups working across the, the world, developing indicators, empirical data for this, and also spatial information that has become available and is open for all us to use. Um, the, the number and size of application has been also uh, growing. Uh, for example, we get information about climate change policies, inequality and poverty, uh, economic analysis by sector, land use, biodiversity, spatial population projection, spatial urbanization. So the application has been growing and growing over the last uh, years, and it's really a recent development in the field. But what I also want to tell is what if you don't work on climate change? If you are a demographer who is interested in these issues, um, how can you, or what can you learn from SSSP, right? Uh, so one of the applications that is one of the most common from SSSP is precisely trying to understand how the future development of the societies will matter in, uh, in order to uh, meet the mitigation targets that we have. And what we have learned, for example, is that for many of these worlds, it's going to be very hard to meet the Paris Agreement target that we already have for reducing the emissions, the greenhouse emissions. Uh, and we also know already that uh, even in some of these worlds that we are able to meet those targets, it's going to be very costly to do so. Um, so what demographers we can learn from this uh, 
from these uh, scenarios also is not only how population dynamics contribute to that. I mean, how much population growth or urbanization actually matter to meet those targets, but also in itself, how, for example, some population population policies are consistent with those futures. What type of policies, for example, policies about fert uh, fertility or policies about human um, uh, sec sec uh, population health are consistent with uh, the scenario of inequality versus a scenario of sustainability? How can we imagine those worlds into the future and what type of policies are more likely to happen in one world or in another? Another example, and I'm not gonna go into detail because it has been already addressed in, in Katz and, and John's talk, is about the heterogeneity of the impacts of climate change, right? And we already know, for example, that uh, the impacts uh, or changes in temperatures, in general, there is an increment, so, uh, a tendency to the increments, but those changes are not equal across the space. Um, so what uh, we can use the scenarios also to improve our models, uh, our mortality models, and also to try to incorporate those changes into our population projections. And what is key in that uh, scenario is to understand um, that we need to better account for regional variation on those impacts, right? That is not going to be the same across, um, across our countries. Another example of how can we use this as a speed is related to households um, and a household heterogeneity. Um, this is my, my own work with uh, Brian O'Neill, and Bas Van Buer and Lewin Yang's group. And this is uh, um, the analysis, for example, of how climate change is gonna impact crop yields. And we know that in many countries, agricultural production is gonna decrease in the coming decades. And for Mexico, for example, that implies that food and energy consumption for households is going to decrease. But we also know that it's not going to be the same across rural and urban households. So can, uh, my, I wonder if we can use that information, for example, to explore better theories about how scarcity and demographic behavior relates. And also, for example, how social policy can be developed for an heterogeneous households given that precisely the SSSP explore different rates of growth, different population compositions, and so on and so forth, right? Um, so um, I also uh, think that demographers can contribute better to the development of uh, the SSSP in itself. On the one hand, demographers can contribute by um, doing uh, what we do best, which is evaluating whether socioeconomic indicators sufficiently describe development pathways as they are now in the SSSP, right? Starting by the population indicators that we have already in, those, in the SSSP. The other thing that we really need right now is to better uh, indicators and greater spatial resolution for the for information uh, that are in the SSSP, and that is central for adaptation and impact analysis of climate change. Um, the third task that is important is that most of the analysis, uh, many of the integrated assessment models that are out there produce global assessment of climate change impacts. Um, and in the last year, there has been a push for develop regional models that are take into account the, the development pathways that are taking place in Latin America, Europe, or country specific. And I think we need more of that. And that requires the contribution of demographers to specify what will be the pathways that uh, in demographic terms will take place in the coming de decades. Um, and then I think the other issues that we also could contribute better is to understand what is the relationship between mitigation and adaptation. A lot of these models were initially developed to understand how me, uh, population will impact um, the level of emissions. And I think we need to better understand the other way around. I mean, how climate change is impacting population, but also how, what is the demographic behavior that is taking place? I'm gonna wrap up in one second, Raya. And therefore, what are the, to what extent demographic behavior is changing as a way to adapt to uh, the impacts of climate change, as we already heard from uh, fertility, migration, and, and, and the patterns of, of mortality and 
morbidity. Um, and the last thing that I want to say is precisely the question that uh, I didn't answer in the talk, which is how we can project that, right? So um, I think that by definition, the SSSP do not include climate, right? It's we only have socioeconomic variables and do not include the impacts of climate, not climate policy in itself in the SSSP. So I think the question for demographers and for the population and environment community is how can we address in the models um, this interaction between climate and population dynamics? And there are two points that I think were also raised by the other presenters. It's the idea of um, what are the turning points in those population trajectories? Can we figure out into the future points in which temperatures are going to raise to a point in which we actually want to see changes, dramatic changes, so to speak, in population or migration or not? And in what is the speed those are possible and what are those and, and in, are consistent with the narrative of the SSSP? And the other issue is how can we model the fit into the different drivers, right? So how can we model the fit between population growth and urbanization, between energy use and uh, aging, for example, uh, in the models? Um, and I'm gonna stop there. Thank you. Thanks so much, Landy. I think your last slide raised a lot of, of, of questions because it's a, the SSP community themselves also, well, as we know that are thinking of how to how to move forward. Do we have meet a new scenario? Do we downscale and then take into account the feedback? So I just advertise that next year that, that yes, also we're hosting a scenario forum. I think it's in June, but more to come. And I think that that's where demographer and geographer and the biology climate scientists can come together as well. So I have noticed that um, most of the questions in the chats have been answered, I think. It's all of them, but unless um, the the audience, if you want to raise your hand or type in or speak up some of the things, because I think this is the, the opportunity to also have more interaction face to face as well. If, if there's anyone, like, um, I haven't seen any raise hand function yet, but um, or maybe some of the panelists, if you want to <laughs> answer some of the question in. By speaking, that's also good. <laughs> I would just say uh, there. So I got a lot of great questions. Thank you. Um, please feel free to email me too. Like I'm on sabbatical, so that means I have nothing but time but to respond to emails and um, chit chat about climate. So I think there's a lot of work to be done. I'm not sure how many are planning on PAA, but there are very few. Um, sessions devoted to climate and population. So I think we have quite a bit of work to do to remind demographers that this is actually something that's really important that they invest their energy in. So if I can help at all with data questions or whatever, feel free to lean on me. I've just seen the question popping up actually on, yeah, we, we touched upon that a bit, Kat, so maybe you might want to take that too. How do you respond to the many birth bust articles showing up in the media lately? So that that's for me or for, I think probably for all of us, but that's I, I mean, I don't do developed, um, I don't do a lot of work in the US. Um, so, or Europe. So a lot of the birth bust discussions are happening in places where I have a different type of like lived expertise, which is different than a research expertise. Um, but I, I mean, there's so many processes, right, in terms of economic issues and cultural shift and that sort of thing. And I'm sure there's a response happening to, um, you know, ideas of population growth and trying to reduce resource consumption through limiting fertility and that kind of thing. I think there's a lot, there's a lot going on. Um, I'm lucky enough to get to talk to undergraduates and graduate students about what's going on with their own fertility goals um, and hear a lot about that. But then I also see some micro booms happening right now in response to COVID too, and the way lifestyles have shifted. So, I mean, it's, it's an awesome area of research that I think we still continue to, to make sure that we're asking the right questions of the right people um, to, to really understand the processes.
Yeah, I agree Wolfgang that would like to come in. Yeah, Wolfgang? Yes, thank you. There have been uh, this question about the, um, the impact of uh, fertility trends in the near future uh, on a sort of say mitigation. And as I tried to quickly uh, say during my own presentation, we are really now talking about having to come uh, close to zero emissions over the next 20 to 30 years. And much of the effect of higher or lower or more rapidly declining fertility, either in Africa or here, uh, will uh, not be very relevant uh, in the short run over the next couple of decades. Uh, if anything was like it has household level data that show if the parents stay home uh, with their children, they use less energy because they travel less and so on. So in the short run, uh, fertility will not have that impact. And that's when we really have to change our technologies and our behavior. Now, I also wanted to say two things. The one is like how demographers are interested in this and what they think. You may remember that in 2013, uh, in preparation of our OUP book on sort of world population, we had a questionnaire, what extensive sent to all IOSs, P members, PA members, and we got 550 population experts responding about the arguments that will impact future fertility, mortality, and migration. And we asked explicitly about the effects of climate change on this. Uh, but very few of the respondents thought that climate change will have any impact on fertility. Also very few thought that it would change the future course of mortality that is otherwise assumed. Only with migration, uh, they had some views that yes, it could increase future migration. I'm not sure this was 10 years ago almost. I'm not sure whether the answers would be different today. I, this is just a piece of information. And the final piece of information is that you've heard that they, we, they have been sort of separate projections of urban rural place of residence and then of age, sex, and level of education, which is in a way unsatisfactory because all refers to, to people and different attributes. Also whether people live in an urban setting or rural is an attribute of people that should be covered by multidimensional demography. So we are at the moment thinking of whether we uh, can bring them together in sort of a four dimensional uh, population model that has population by age, sex, level of education and urban rural place of residence. But that has of course many data challenges and so on. If I, may, if I may come in, there is a question in the, uh, the Q&A from Alejandro Rodriguez Sanchez uh, for the panel. So how far back can we potentially trace these effects of climate change? Because this is not something that uh, started yesterday. So is there anybody who would like to comment on that? Catherine was already typing. Maybe Joanne can take that it's, <laughs> as a climate scientist. <laughs> how it's on, uh, yeah, how far back can we potentially trace this effect of climate change? In the case of the area of epidemiology, environmental epidemiology, that's highly dependent on the available data, and that has been quite limited. Um, so, only these studies get, well, there are is a, that I'm aware of, a few of them that goes to the beginning of uh, the century, I think, but uh, in general, they don't go beyond the 80s or something like that. And actually what it shows is that uh, in some places, um, uh, the adaptation response has been uh, larger than the impact of uh, the warming. So it is sometimes, as uh, I was said before with migration, it's sometimes difficult to distinguish between the each each of the two contribute uh, contributions. There are other studies about attribution that uh, that take into account counterfactual scenarios, but in these scenarios, of course, we cannot model epidemiological. Uh, we cannot calculate the epidemiological associations, and so they are counterfactual climate and associations that are taken into account. If I, if I may, there is another question of somebody from Kees van der Geest from the Union, United Nations University Institute for Environmental Environment and Human Security who would like to pose a question live. Is that possible? So, Paul, can you give him the floor? Hi. Uh, can you raise your hand uh, if you want to speak that way? There we go. You can now talk. 
You, you have to unmute yourself. Okay, yeah. And you hear me short. now? Yeah, yes. keep it short. Yes, I, and, and sorry, I just pushed the, the enter button too early. I was writing up my question, but now that I have the floor, I will ask it anyway. So the question is like, um, uh, Clark, you mentioned as, as many of the reviews of, of climate and migration that most of the moves are internal. And uh, I was wondering whether um, this may be something that is changing uh, now. Do you have any, because for example, I've been working on in West Africa where this has historically really been the case with most movements being internal. But I see now also kind of people from lower income groups and uh, that are also starting to, to move internationally. Is that something you have, you're also observing or you have been reading about in studies? Well, there, there's a migration transition that's been well described in which as countries become, as countries develop, both internal and international migration become more common. And so just uh, based on that experience, without climate change, we'll expect internal international migration to become more common for many countries, particularly in Africa. But the fraction of movers who are international migrant, migrants globally is very low. It's like maybe one or 2%. Um, so most moves that are happening are internal, and th and that's true for also for for climate induced uh, migration is what I would say. Thank you. There is there is a very important question, a very nice question from Beth Fussell in the in the in the audience, uh, thanking Wolfgang for raising the point that demographers' engagement with climate change uh, research is there, but. To all of the panelists, what messages should we be emphasizing to attract a new generation of demographers to this area of research? So let's uh, let's involve future generations of researchers in this this debate. How which messages are we uh, are we going to give them? Well, maybe I can. And can start and the others can also contribute. It's it clearly, I mean, as I'm, I'm teaching a course on population uh, and uh, environmental changes, and uh, are clear that many of the students these days are very concerned about environmental change. And uh, for them, it's often new uh, to view this together uh, with uh, changes in, in demographic parameters. And just to point at some of these, and particularly, I think. Uh, in the past, the, the impact has been only on the mitigation side, how population trends um, impact on climate change, which has been a very controversial uh, discussion. We let just some people saying it's all due to high fertility in Africa, the problem, and others saying, no, it's only the consumption in the north. I think the discussion gets much more differentiated now uh, if we look at the differential vulnerability and the adaptive capacity to climate change. And, and there, I think demographers have a lot to offer uh, in, in terms of uh, the analytical tools we have, the data we have, uh, the approaches we have. So there's lots of good research and important research to be done for young scientists. Yeah. My quick, you know, Landy and I have been talking about this a lot. So Landy, jump in. But, um, and Clark might have something to say about this too, but I think there's a big question of um, spatial data and how people, there's a lot of a need for people to learn how to work with the data that's required to do a lot of this work. And I think this is really interdisciplinary work that's pulling, like we've seen here, this is quite an interdisciplinary, I know we're all sort of dorky demographers, but we're all from different backgrounds. Um, and have different types of training. And I think we can kind of need to bring that in a little bit into demography in ways that maybe we haven't seen, um, at least in the recent sort of ways that we've been educating our, our new cohorts is really giving them exposure to these other types of ways of thinking about climate and how to actually do climate change research. Landy. I totally agree with you. Um, um, I will also add that um, learning for me, uh, working on these population and environment issues is learning how to speak with people from other disciplines and how to understand the way they uh, uh, 
uh, not only work with the data, but how they frame the problems in a different way, and learning also learning from them how they understand the pro the issues about environment and climate change, and I think. For many of us, that's an incentive. I mean, it's, it's not a, a, a hop to, to jump up, but in, rather something that is for many of us get excited. And I agree also with Lutz that I think in, in the more in the more younger cohort of people training in demography, I think there is an excitement about working in, in this intersection of disciplines. And I think this is a field that is 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 offered that possibility of working with different kinds of data, different disciplines and emphasizing that for the people who are working on this for a, for a while, I think it's gonna be a way to bring people in, in the, into this area. Nicole is ready to close the seminar. It's, uh, yes, we are at the end. Maybe I, I try to speak quickly in the sense that I just want to Thanks the panelists, thanks the audience, of course, thanks IUSSP, EPS, and then PERN. And this is, I think this is a, the, not the start. We have done a lot of work on this and, and hopefully where we in a year or two time, we can reconvene again and, 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 and give even more so so we may have the population projection that account for climate change. So just, just want to say that wait for, for the next seminar from us too. So Nicole, I pass back to you. Yes, uh, thank you, and uh, and sorry to uh, to stop this uh, this this very interesting conversation. Uh, also, on on behalf of IOSP, of course, a, a very big uh, thank you to all our, our speakers. Excellent uh, presentations. We are very happy, and uh, uh, also thank you to to organizers and and the audience and and the lively discussion that that we had. And indeed, uh, we ended up with uh, how to uh, how to uh, involve uh, new generations. Uh, what 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 messages to 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 share? Definitely, this is a growing field, and uh, the IUSSP will do everything to uh, to to stimulate that discussion and provide platforms. And we hope that Pern will play and keep playing a very important role in that. Now, the first place to continue this conversation will, of course, be our international population conference in December. So you're uh, all uh, welcome uh, to, to join us uh, there. There will be several sessions on, on this topic as Susanna already said. So, so register and join us there and uh, also keep abreast of all the other countdown events uh, to that uh, International Population Conference. Stay tuned to IOSSP. Thank you all. And last, but definitely not least, a big thank you to Paul Monet of IOSSP Secretary who did a great job for uh, moderating and, and organizing this, this webinar without Paul, this would not have been possible. Thanks to all of you and I hope to see you in uh, virtually in the IPC in December. Signing off. <laughs>